Welcome to the MMA Happy Hour. I am Kyle Anthony, your host. We're here. We have interviews, MMA banter, and betting advice. This week, UFC Paris, Cyril Gaon versus Sergey Spivak. We're going to talk three plays here like we always do on the show. We're going to get betting advice. We're going to talk all things this UFC Paris. But we also have here Miranda Maverick, UFC flyweight. Excited to have you here. We're going to get some of your takes here and, and dive into some things. But uh, how you doing? How are things going? It's going well. You know, I had training pretty much all day until a couple oh. of ago and uh, glad to be on the show. All right. All right. We, we're, we're, able to, we're able to just sneak it in. I know you're busy. I know you're busy. Um, but the first thing I think is, is a great just starting point to ask you. And, you know, you've, you're at this point, you're in the UFC, but kind of turning it back to the start of your MMA career and kind of where it got to this point. I mean, some of the things that, you know, you, you have that wrestling background and, and I know, I, I don't know if it was college or high school where you were wrestling with, on the men's team and, and kind of building yourself up. When was it the point where you said, okay, I'm dropping everything and I'm going to start focusing on a career in mixed martial arts? Yeah, so it's actually funny. There's a big misconception around my wrestling pedigree um, because that's what everybody likes to talk about because I guess it's more hyped up than jujitsu, right? But I actually started jujitsu my junior year of high school, loved it so much. And I was like, you know, I'm doing really well at these jujitsu competitions. Let me try wrestling because I think it will benefit me here and help me with the self-defense aspect, help me with the competition of jujitsu aspect. So I started doing wrestling my senior year of high school, did very well on the varsity men's team or boys team, I guess, because we didn't have a female mm -hmm. team at the time. Amusingly, when my brother and sister got into high school, it was their first year in Missouri of having women's wrestling. So my sister got to be on her own girls team. Mm -hmm. I was happy for her. Um, but then I went to college um, my first freshman year. They didn't have a wrestling team at Drury University, but my sophomore year they did. They ended up getting a men's wrestling team. And at the end of my semester of my freshman year, a coach came into the middle of my class, pulled me out of class and asked me if I wanted to join the men's wrestling team. And I was baffled and I was like, no, I don't. I'm not that great at wrestling. I don't want to <laughs> buy a bunch of college wrestling. No, thank you. But <laughs> Yeah, because I had, you know, fought, or not fought, but trained with many college wrestlers. And I was like, I just get wiped up on the floor with them, right? Like, it's terrible. Mm -hmm. And like, no, it wouldn't be necessarily for you to compete. You're not allowed to anyway, because you're already a professional. But we would like to have you on the team for our own exposure, and it would help you with all the training. And I was like, sweet, I'm in. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, so I joined on their team, was on it for the last two years I was in college there and loved it, got way stronger, my cardio was better, and of course got better wrestling as well. Um, but the funny thing is I had already had my year of amateur done and had already been a professional for a year before I started wrestling with the college team. Oh, wow. Well, wow. So when you made that transition, though, was anybody like, you're crazy going to do, you know, you look going to full time MMA or, or it was kind of, you know, people were kind of saying, hey, yeah, this is this, this is your path. Yeah, I'd say it was the opposite. It was, why aren't you doing MMA? Do you want to do, <laughs> do MMA? And then right before I turned 18, when I was, uh, let's see, it was about a month before I turned 18, I knew I was going to be at college in Springfield. And before that, I was just training once a week at Springfield Fight Club in Missouri. And when I knew I was going to college there, I was like, okay, I'll live within two miles of the gym. I can jog to the gym, ride my bike, you know, and I can be there every single day for training. And they were like, well, I doubt you'll be here every day. And I was like, I'll be here every day. Right. <laughs> I started training every day a couple months beforehand because I got a job in Springfield, started tra traveling back and forth, took four weeks of striking before I had my first fight booked. Wow. Wow. So, I mean, it, it, it was a, it was a train coming through at that point. You were, you were all in pretty much when it, the coach telling you, uh, you know, everything kind of started to go in line with that. That's, that's pretty amazing though, to go from that to again, building yourself up, getting into the UFC, doing great things. And, and that even kind of brings me to the next question really of, you know, when you were looking at your last fight, you know, you went out there against Priscilla Cachoeira, dominated the fight, start to finish. But the one thing, though, and, and we're going to talk about that particular fight in a second. But the one thing here is that, you know, you had a fight at UFC 289. You didn't have anything scheduled. And then it comes out. It's, it's a, it was a short notice 
for you coming into this fight? So even like it was a couple weeks, I believe, but even with that, how does that even come about with you? I mean, obviously you you're just came back from training. You're always training. You're always trying to improve, but how does it even get to the point where you're saying, okay, this is, I'm going to take this and, and what changes in your, in your training with weeks notice at that point? Yeah, it, honestly, intensity is the only real thing that changes. You know, I have the same trainings in fight camp, out of fight camp. Now, I'm not saying I won't skip one every once in a while. <laughs> not fight camp, you know, I'll prioritize like a family dinner or mm -hmm. my family, something like that. But in fight camp, the intensity just levels up, right? My rounds of sparring are very tailored to me. I only go with certain partners. Both my coaches show up for just about every training. It gets much more personalized, much harder trainings that are just focused around, here's the exact techniques we need to work on. Now, what I don't do is tailor my training camp to a specific fighter because my goal is to be one of the best in the world, not be as good as that girl I'm fighting, right? So I train for what I'm best at. Every once in a while, there will be something we'll watch out for, right? For instance, Priscilla, it's like, okay, let's watch out for her right hand, right? Like mm -hmm. she power at me okay we're aware of it but we're still focusing on our game plan right and that's kind of how it works um but yeah nothing really changes in or out of fight camp and are you for me i'm i'm kind of for my career i'm consistently watching tape trying to find an edge between two fighters not getting are you do you watch tape at all do you have your team watch it or do you kind of just like you're saying i mean obviously you always want to prove all aspects of your game but just the tape and being like okay let me sit down and watch their last like three four fights I watch every fight. I watch yeah. every fight I can find every fight. I'm actually probably more into it than I should be. My coaches usually watch their more recent fights. We go over trends that we see, you know, especially defensively, um, offensively. Once again, like I still play my game, but we watch out for those certain things that they might throw at us. We analyze whether they're going to be a grappler, a striker, all the above, like watch out for this. Mm -hmm. Don't about this you know it's like for instance i wasn't too worried about going on the ground with priscilla whether i was on top or bottom i knew i'd get on top eventually and beat her up uh, and that was kind of the the goal of this one um but that didn't mean i wasn't ready to throw with her at the same time right right so with that fight now i'm not gonna say anything bad about priscilla but she may not be i guess the, the cleanest fighter when it comes to rules or certain things. I mean, going back to Jillian Robertson, you know, her whole situation there where, you know, listen, she, she was choked out and you can't mistake gouging an eye. I mean, poking an eye may be standing, but gouging an eye is a whole different story. So going into that fight and even in your fight, I mean, there was maybe five fouls that weren't called. I mean, grab, you know, grabbing your wrist, grabbing the cage, foot in the cage, I mean, all kinds of things. So I guess my question more is, what were your thought process before the fight? And then middle of that first round, you must have been like, what's going on here? <laughs> None of it was unexpected, though. You know, I don't even mm. want to talk crap too much. Everybody saw what they saw. You know, I've already dealt my piece with her. She said how I was calling her disrespectful and all this when uh, when she didn't cheat and didn't mean to. And I'm like, OK, like everybody saw what happened. Right. Many instances, the eyes, my shirt, like everything, uh, the toes, the hands grabbing all of it. But uh, at the end of the day, like, it's a fight. I was prepared for anything. We knew to be careful with her for the Jillian Robertson thing. I actually showed the ref in the back when he came to give the rules meeting. I showed him the video. And I was like, listen, I have had retina surgeries before. I cannot take damage to my eyes like that. I might be out of fighting for my life if somebody tries to gouge my eyes out like that. Um, mm. Which you know, is a danger that I come in there prepared to know that's possible. Um, but he was very good. I thought the ref did a great job. There's a couple times that I'm like, mm, maybe could have taken a point or something. Yeah. <laughs> At the same time, in the dominant position, it wasn't hurting any, you know. Um, but there were some some scary moments in the fight. Uh, and afterwards, it's just laughable, honestly. But right. I went there expecting that. Everybody, I even had people saying, why did you take this fight? What are you doing? Like, my own dad was like, I don't like this fight for you because of the eyes. Like, what if your eyes get hurt again? And my Jasmine just sued a vicious fight. I had just gotten my eye hurt two weeks mm. prior pretty badly. So it was a question of what are you doing? But it was a short notice offer against a game opponent that was a perfect matchup for me. And I stay ready for those short notices. And I hate saying no to fights unless I'm injured. Usually I'm I'm game. Yeah, that's that's a, and you physically had the care I mean the the your phone and showed the ref that and was the ref like man she's prepared. She's ready to show some some footage of, of this. Was, wow, you're right. I didn't expect this. And he's like, all right, I'll watch out for it. No problem. 
And I was like, yeah, well, he, he did. I think he did a good job. He did. He did a good. I mean, there was a few things he missed, but that's okay. You still, <laughs> you still but won. He missed because he was watching another thing she was doing. <laughs> yeah, there was too many fouls going on. So, <laughs> all right. So I'm gonna ask you quickly about. There's a big, big, big fight coming up in September in your vision. Grasso versus Shevchenko here. Now, the first time, I'm not going to lie, I really thought Shevchenko was going to go out there, get the job done. I just think very, very highly of her, her skill set, everything she can do. How did you kind of see – how do you kind of see this second fight going? Do you think Grasso is going to get it done again, or, or is it going to be Shevchenko getting that title again? I like Grasso. I think she's a sweet human, um, but I think Shevchenko's – going to go in there and just blast her. I think it's going to be the same story as the Nunez versus Penny the second time around, you know? I mean, Shevchenko got to where she was like, yeah, I'm beating these girls so easy. Like, I doubt she slacks up. She doesn't seem like that kind of person. But your mindset gets a hold when you're just sitting there stagnant, you know? Like, a change is almost desired. You know, there's that pressure. But I don't even think she was losing the first fight with Grasso. Mm -hmm. I think she was doing a good job there and just piecing her way, playing safe. And Grasso ended up catching her, right? I don't think that Grasso would have won that fight had it went all five rounds at all. Um, and I think Shevchenko is going to go in there just more violently this time and finish it to put a stamp on it. And I truly think that she's kind of still the top of the class there. I think there's some up and comers that are coming up. Like a lot of us are getting younger in that division. Um, you know, it was like a lot of older women in the top 15. And over the past two, three years, actually, since I've joined the UFC, a lot more new young faces have been coming up. And it's really exciting to see that movement in another division other than just straw weight. Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely a lot of new. I think in, in a lot of the divisions we're seeing that I feel like it's like the changing of the guard of those known names coming up with the young group. So that's going to be exciting to see. But we are definitely going to talk next about the main event. It's Cyril Gone minus 160 against Sergey Spivak. So I'm going to give a quick breakdown on this fight here. So obviously this is going to be a grappler versus striker matchup. We know what we're going to be getting here. It stays on the feet. Gon's going to have that movement, that footwork to get the job done. And then if it goes on the ground, we've seen issues with uh, just what Gon can do on the ground. Now, I think the one thing here that a lot of people are overreacting to is the two losses that Cyril Gon has. I mean, he's has two losses and they are two arguably the two baddest men on the planet, uh, Francis Ngannou and John Jones. So losing to those two guys, it can't, it doesn't really hurt you. You do lose, but it doesn't really hurt you. He was taken down. There's a clear vulnerability there. He cannot stop the takedowns. He had, had has issues, but I don't really think to me looking at this, I don't really think that that's going to be an issue for Gon due to his distance management, due to the way he switches stances so smoothly. He can really attack from both sides, going to disguise a lot of his attacks overall. I think that does help him, but the footwork is going to be huge. I think cutting of the distance for Sergey is going to be difficult. Also, he's a flat-footed guy. Now, to quickly go over his last few wins, I mean – they were all very slow guys. Like, let's just be honest here. Uh, Alexei Olenek, who's one in five out of his uh, one in four out of his last five, was in his mid forties, very slow. Derek Lewis, one in four out of his last five, slow, looking for the bomb. Greg Hardy, zero oh, and three in the UFC, no longer with the UFC, and I don't even think he's really an MMA fighter to begin with. Augusto Sakai, another guy, one in four. And then he loses to Tom Aspinall, who has that ability, who kind of, you know, although Aspinall's better to ground definitely has that that light-footedness, that striking ability. So I like Cyril Gaon here. I think it goes out there, gets the job done. I like the minus 160 number here, him as the favorite. How do you see it? Do you think that Spivak's going to get this to the ground and maul him, or is Gaon going to just do his thing on the feet? I think Gaon's going to do his thing on the feet. Um, I see Cyril, like you said, winning on the feet. I see him as the much more athletic fighter here. Um, and even... You know, it might get taken to the ground, but I see him as being fast enough to stop the takedowns potentially and keep that distance. So I agree. I would be betting zero gone if I was betting. But All I right. I like to hear that. All right. The other one quickly I'm going to go over is going to be Vulcan Ozdemir versus uh, Bogdan Gustav, if I completely I on this one because yeah this <laughs> next one though i next one i got you on the next one so this one real quickly for the listeners i'm going to be giving them the play here minus 190 and the comeback here is gustav plus 155 real quickly this is going to be an absolute 
car crash. These two guys are going to come forward. They're going to be throwing. Both of them have the ability to get the finish, look for the finish, hunt for the finish, and willing to stand and block punches with their face and throw forward. So this is the spot here where you look at Vulcan, 18 victories. He, he has 13 by finish, 12 knockouts. Gustav, 14 victories, 12 knockouts, two by submission, 100% finish rate. This is his UFC debut. That, to me, is already already pushing you towards Vulcan. And then you look at the fact this is a short notice fight. We just talked about a little bit about short notice fight. So UFC debut, short notice fight against the guy who Vulcan has fought top level guys. I mean, he's fought Daniel Cormier, Dominic Reyes, Rakic, Yuri Perhoshka, Magomed and Goliath. I mean, he's fought some elite level guys. Now the other side here, Gustav has fought very low level guys. A lot of guys with just either starting their MMA career or almost ending their MMA career. So he has not really faced that high level talent. His boxing is good, but I do think that if he continues to push forward, he is not the guy that he, he has not really been able to, when he makes a mistake, he has not been able to be paid for it by these lower level guys. Vulcan will push the pace, go forward. I think he lands the big shot early. I do like Vulcan, the minus 190 number, but I do like Vulcan by knockout plus 110. I think that one's going to get the job done. But for you, I'm going to be asking you about the return of Thug Rose. The return of Thug Rose here. She's moving up in weight. Big spot for her. Did great against Wei Li. Looked good. And everyone, I feel like, has forgot about Rose after her fight against Carla Sparza. Lackluster. She even admitted it that she kind of said it was not the greatest performance for her. How do you see that? Well, first, I guess, do you think it's a good move up for her? But also... How do you kind of see this against uh, Manon Fury in the co-main event of Saturday? Yeah, against Manon, you know, that's going to be a hard fight for a first one at flyweight. I honestly think that Rose is fairly small for a flyweight. Um, mm -hmm. I've been there, I've trained with her before. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing how she does. I'm rooting for her, but I do think she's very small going up in that weight class. She has power at 115. I, I think that might be negligible in the 125-pound division. And she has good grappling. She's well-rounded, of course. Um, but so is Manon. But I do see Manon as having more of a striking background. And I honestly think Rose might try to take this to the ground, um, which isn't a spot that we often see Rose at. Um, mm. I'm interested in watching this. I am i don't even want to say my pick for it, but yes. uh, but I would I would probably go with Manon on this oh, one. Okay. All right. All right. I'm leaning... I'm leaning a little bit on the Rose side, but your point is, I mean, man, it is a, she's a monster. I mean, she comes forward. She has big power. The only thing I think that if, if there was anything they said, maybe take it to the ground is the, is that speed. But again, it's to your point, does she carry that speed? Does it, does it, how much does it change moving up? There's a lot of question marks with her. I mean, I just love the pedigree of Rose, but again, it kind of comes down to that kind of stuff too. So, so you're, you're taking Manon. I think so. I think <laughs> the speed versus power thing. And, you know, Rose even said it. She's just looking for a change. You know, she's like, oh, I just it's almost like a bucket list thing. I don't know that it's a I'm going to stay here, be a champion of the world at flyweight. I think it's more let me see what I can do here. Um, and that, that attitude, you know, she has a different mindset than a lot of fighters, though. So it's kind of hard for me to say anything. It's like I don't have Rose's mindset. I don't think I do very well with that mindset. But mm -hmm. uh the whole have fun thing is also important. I know it's definitely important for her where her mindset is at. So I don't know. I'm going to go with Manon, but I'd be happy if I was wrong. <laughs> and and sometimes I feel like when fighters leave divisions, it, it, are they are they trying to, you know, the boogeyman, they're trying to get away from it, or they didn't have that good feeling in a certain division or whatever it is. But again, she was the champion. She, you know, a lot of great things from her. So uh, that be that. Uh, you will go with men. And now the last one real quickly, I'm going to go over is Angelosa versus uh, Rise McKee. Real quickly here, this spot here, I like the underdog here. I think McKee is lanky. I think that he's got the advantages in certain spots. I think Losa, strong guy, can look for some takedowns, but I just don't think his striking's there. I really like what um, McKee can do at range. He's going to have that four-inch reach advantage. Also, the fact that when Losa fought Lizez, who had a two-inch reach advantage, he definitely was struggling with the movement, struggling with a lot of the, 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 the forward pressure the good volume. I think that's where McKee is going to have a lot of success overall. Plus Losa, a lot of people just really like him because he was 
had a competitive fight, I guess, so-called, against Jack Battelle Medellina on Contender Series, which was a great fight. He still lost 3 nothing in the decision, but... I really think this is a good spot for McKee to get the job done. So as my last play, I am taking Rice McKee plus 150. Now, before you get out of here and we let you go back to work, I don't know. I don't know if you're going back to the gym or not. You're doing doubles. Either way, um, what's next for you? Uh, when are we going to see in the cage and, and kind of what's some stuff you got coming up? I'm really hoping that I'll be in the cage before the holidays, so before Thanksgiving. Um, no news yet, though. Um, I keep just waiting, waiting for a call, right? But I'm one of those people that stays ready for short notices, so anytime I see kind of flyweights within my ranking range get on the screen, I'm ready to go. Um, but, yeah, hope to see myself in there at least once by the end of the year. I'm really hoping for twice, but that hasn't happened prior in my uh, UFC years. They don't seem to like us fighting too much. But then there's certain fighters that do, so you never know. You never and, – and, and who knows? There may be another short notice opportunity for you, you know. And, and I guess, like, to your point before, you're, you're, you're staying somewhat ready for, you know, fight ready, which is – Lot, I guess not a lot of people really are always doing that. They're kind of, you know, really taking off and then diving back into shape real quickly. But, um, but yeah, you know, I, I would love to have you on again down the road. Appreciate your time here. And for anybody else, you got to check out her merchandise. You got to check out the farm bar. You got to check out all kinds of stuff she's got going on over there. Great stuff. Check it out. Um, and that's it. That's the show. Appreciate your time, Miranda. And, uh, We'll talk soon. Uh, enjoy, everybody. Let's get some winners and uh, see you next time. Thank you very much.